Thank you very much, Chantal. And um, oh, I even see some of my students here. So uh, I hope I don't disappoint. Uh, I have about 20 minutes, so let me begin now, and then there'll be time for questions afterwards. So there is a deep sense of foreboding in the West. We feel that we are heading down towards something, but we're not sure what that something is. Uh, Timothy Snyder, who's a well-known historian of totalitarianism, has said in a recent book called On Tyranny that this is 1933 in the West. 1933, of course, is the year that Hitler took power in Germany. And Snyder brings out many frightening parallels between that moment and this. And of course, one should never dismiss such a frightening thought, in part out of the very thought that people dismissed it then and they, they turned out to be wrong. But that's not my view. I think that the institutions of the Western world are far stronger today than they were at that time. And so the question is what? What is it that we are heading down to that we fear and that we must avoid? And I think the answer is liberalism, the loss of liberalism, the loss of liberal values. Now, what do I mean by that? What is the meaning of this word liberalism? How is it different from democracy? So let me just read you a brief passage. So another uh, well-known political scientist named Yasha Monk, who has just written a book about this, offers a very useful set of distinctions. So, pardon me. This is, what he, this is what he writes. He says, a democracy is a set of binding electoral institutions that effectively translate popular views into public policy. Liberal institutions effectively protect the rule of law and guarantee individual rights, such as freedom of speech, worship, press, and association to all citizens, including ethnic and religious minorities. And so therefore, a liberal democracy is simply a political system that is both liberal and democratic, one that both protects individual rights and translates popular views into public policy. And so his argument is that it is liberalism that is now in danger. So, so what do I mean by that? So we now live in a world where there are many democratic leaders, which is to say leaders who have been elected by majorities and who would be re-elected by majorities, who have nevertheless used those majorities to undermine those liberal values. And I could give you examples from all across the world uh, I will just uh, use the one example of, of Hungary. So Hungary is a very interesting example because, of course, it was part of the Soviet Empire. And when the Soviet Empire collapsed after 1989, Hungary was one of those countries which people felt most hopeful about because it had a deeply liberal tradition in its pre-communist uh, history. And yet, uh, nine, eight or nine years ago, uh, Hungary elected a prime minister named Viktor Orban who actually uses the expression illiberal democracy. He describes himself proudly as an illiberal. And so what does he mean by that? He means that he doesn't accept the free market. He believes the free market is rigged by uh, big American and European corporations, and it's his job to protect the Hungarian people from that. Uh, he doesn't believe in untrammeled freedom of speech. Uh, and he has tried, so far not completely successfully, to restrict freedom of speech in Hungary. He sees uh, NGOs, foreign NGOs, as being a peril to Hungarians. He is hostile to immigration of any kind. And he often says, uh, we must ensure that Hungary is there for Hungarians and not for others. He's sufficiently hostile to Europe, though of course Hungary is a member of the European Union, uh, that he is constantly uh, uh, creating tensions with the EU, uh, which is, has contemplated censuring him and, 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 and punishing Hungary, though it has not yet brought itself uh, to do so. But he's seen as a kind of anti European figure in the heart of, of Europe. But of course, the great example of illiberal democracy is Donald Trump. 
and we wouldn't be having this conversation today if Donald Trump had not been elected president of the United States. Now, Trump, again, like Orban, makes no secret of the fact that he is an illiberal Democrat. Who are the people whom Trump admires? They're only strongmen. His, the people he admires most are, of course, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, President Sisi of Egypt, President Duterte of Philippines, a man who is a thug. Uh, and these are the people whom Trump feels most sense of kinship with, as opposed to with other Democratic leaders uh, in Europe. Uh, he has, of course, referred to the press as the enemy of the people, which is almost a, a kind of fascist echo. And indeed, the expression that he likes to use, America first, is an expression that any American would know uh, was first used by a man named Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh was the famous uh, pilot who was also a Nazi sympathizer. And so these are words that echo with a fascist residence, which is why it's easy to understand that somebody like Timothy Snyder would imagine the United States being in, in 1933. The thing that Trump has added to this, which is quite new, is his attack on facts, on reality, this expression, fake news, his willingness to uh, treat even the most preposterous opinion as being equal to the word of, is equal to the value of fact. And this is an attack on liberalism, which I'm not sure we've even thought about in the past, because it, the issue hasn't arisen before. Uh, it is a, a, a premise of liberal thinking, really first and best enunciated by a political philosopher named Isaiah Berlin, that, that a liberal society depends on what Berlin called pluralism, which is to say the recognition that many different truths might be true, that you cannot think as, as you might in private terms about the, an absolute truth like a truth of religion, that in the public world we have to be skeptical, we have to be open to alternatives to reasons to argumentation. And Trump has, has, has threatened that. And, and it, it may be more than anything else that's the reason to be fearful about what he represents. So let me just step back a little bit now and explain why I think this has come about. Why do we live in this world of illiberal democracy? And I think the first thing that we need to recognize is that liberalism is not the same thing as majoritarianism. Liberal values do not necessarily, and often in fact do not enjoy, democratic support. So the first great liberal thinker, and the person who is the beginning of the book that, that uh, Chantal mentioned that I wrote, is John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill was the person who really first most powerfully made the argument for the right of freedom of speech and the right to behave as you wish to behave. Well, Mill was writing in the early 19th century at a time when maybe 6% of English adults had the right to vote. Now, Mill thought of himself as a Democrat, believed in democracy, but he never would have accepted the idea that all adults should vote. He thought you shouldn't vote unless you were a property holder. And he worried all his life about the relationship between liberalism and democracy. And he worried that ignorant people, people who were not educated, wouldn't defer to knowledgeable people. And he didn't know what you would do if everybody had the right, because he worried, the right to vote, I'm sorry, because he worried that they would not support liberal values once they had the right to vote. So that was a widespread fear. And yet, in the 20th century, Everybody got the right to vote. And remarkably, the 20th century was the century of liberal democracy, that basically all Western European, Western European countries were liberal democracies. So why was that? Why were those fears uh, not realized? I think the chief reason is that liberalism itself developed in a way that made it majoritarian. So the Mill's liberalism, which was individual rights, your right to speak as you wish and act as you wish, that was a, a, a taste of for only a minority. What happened to liberalism in the early 20th century is that it recognized that economic freedom, the right to bargain your own labor and so forth, didn't mean very much if you were working in a giant company. So it accepted the need for unions, for example. It accepted the idea that the government has to be involved 
in the economic life of the people. So the older form said no government should stand aside and let the free market operate. 20th century liberalism said no, no, we need a social safety net. We need government supplied health care. We need government supplied uh, education. And so when the Great Depression occurred in the 1930s, capitalism all by itself, the free market all by itself might have perished because it was seen to have failed. But because of the liberal state, because people didn't starve to death, at least not in very large numbers, capitalism survived. And so in some ways, liberalism saved capitalism. And then, of course, in World War II, fascism was defeated by the liberal states of Europe and by the United States. And so liberalism was seen as a thing that was powerful and, and of course, morally good. And when the Cold War finally came to an end in 1989, again, it was liberalism that was seen to have defeated all of the rival ideologies, such that in 1989, a well-known political scientist, Francis Fukuyama, wrote about what he called the end of history, by which he meant the end of ideological combat. There had been a fight throughout the 20th century between rival ideologies and liberalism. Liberalism won. The 1990s, in fact, was the high watermark of liberal democracy. Liberal democracies grew across the world. And yet, at the same time, liberalism was eroding. It wasn't clear then. It became clear afterwards. The world we live in today, I think, probably has its roots at that time. And so that then raises the question, what is it that changed, that suddenly imperiled what had been this taken-for-granted situation? So let me, let me read you um, something else from the same person, from Yasha Monk, who says, what were the conditions that had made liberalism so successful, and, and, and how did they change? And here's what he writes. He says there are three conditions. First, the dominance of mass media limited the distribution of extreme ideas, created a set of shared facts and values, and slowed the spread of fake news. But the rise of the internet and of social media has since weakened traditional gatekeepers, empowering once marginal movements and politicians. Two, all through the history of democratic stability, most citizens enjoyed a rapid increase in their living standards and held out high hopes for an even better future. In many places, citizens are now treading water and fear that they will suffer much greater hardship in the future. And three, nearly all stable democracies were either founded as mono-ethnic nations or allowed one ethnic group to dominate. Now this dominance is increasingly being challenged. So let me just talk about these three conditions briefly. I think probably he should have put the economic thing one. And so sometime in the late 70s to early middle of the 1980s, middle class economic growth slowed and stopped. Different periods in different countries. But liberalism had always been based on the, on the idea of bettering your own position, bettering your own situation, social mobility, economic growth. In part because it is much easier to be generous towards minorities. It is much easier to accept hearing ideas you don't like and in general being optimistic about your situation if you feel like your life is going to get better. And that stopped happening about 30 years ago. What happened is that economic growth in most Western countries became increasingly distributed towards the top. Middle class didn't do very well. And global economic growth increasingly was distributed away from the West and towards the developing world, the creation of new middle classes in India, China, South American countries, and elsewhere. And so increasingly, the, the middle class in the United States and in Europe saw themselves being passed by, by elites in their own country and by, uh, by people in the rest of the world whom they, over whom they had once enjoyed a kind of easy dominance. And, so, and, and that 
existed before 2008. The economic crisis of 2008 made it much, much worse. And it's no coincidence that it was immediately after 2008 that Viktor Orban became prime minister, that the French party, the National Front, became far more powerful, that in the United States the Tea Party arose. But all those things were the culmination of a longer process. Let me talk briefly about the other two things that Yasha Monk mentioned. So one, of course, is this question I talked about a moment before, which is changes in our media environment. So the way I tend to think about this is that for a long time, information was a thing that we received, and received with a certain kind of deference towards the authorities who issued it to us. That is to say, towards authors, towards scientists, towards television news anchors. It was the deference in a way that John Stuart Mill had worried about. In the social media world, of course, there's no such thing as an author anymore. Everybody's an author. Everybody's opinion is seen as equal to everybody else's opinion. The idea of deference towards authority or expertise seems superfluous. And what it's done, in effect, is that it's blurred the line, not just between the ordinary person and the expert, but even between fact and opinion. And we live more and more in a world in which an argument means my facts against your facts. And so that Isaiah Berlin pluralistic, rational, skeptical world, which liberalism depended on, has really disappeared. But it's important to add that it's disappeared also because there are politicians prepared to exploit it. You need a Donald Trump and not just the technology. You need a politician who sees advantage in exploiting the, the greater vulnerability of reason and reasoned discourse. The third thing is very interesting and troubling, that a, you need a homogeneous society to build a liberal democracy on. Now, the reason why Monk says this is the following, that World War II led to a, a terrible sorting out of peoples, such that in the aftermath of the war, most European countries became effectively mono-ethnic. That is to say, the people of Hungary were Hungarian, the people of the Czech, Czech, then Czechoslovakia were Czech and Slovak, the German people were Germans. Upon this mono-ethnic world, that is to say, upon the consensus and the sense of shared history, it was easier to build a liberal democracy. Now, the United States in many ways was quite different. It wasn't built on the idea of nationality. But for all of our language of diversity, cosmopolitanism, and so forth, it is a fact that liberal democracies were built on monocultures. And all of us here in the Emirates can understand the idea that it is far easier to found a political culture on a, on a homogeneous group, because after all, in the Emirates, all citizens are members of the same nationality, ethnicity, language group, and virtually religion. That's an extreme case. Uh, but Europe was a, a more uh, a modest case of that until the 1970s, 80s, 90s, when significant numbers of non-European immigrants, of whom many but by no means all were, were from the Islamic world, came into Europe as immigrants. There was a kind of unintended social experiment that was performed in much of Europe. Nobody intended to do this. But now uh, Europe has been trying to sustain a liberal democracy created at a moment of homogeneity in a very heterogeneous world. And I, I spent time in Holland, for example, when they had an election this past spring. The Dutch are famously tolerant. It is the first article of their constitution is the equal status of all people of whatever sort. But the four biggest cities in Holland are now 40% to 50% non-Dutch origin. That's astonishing. That's in a, that is a, a, an almost unheard of thing in the modern world. It would not have been in an earlier world. It is now. And I spent time talking to people there. And I remember a guy I talked to in a bar in Rotterdam who was very upset by this. And he said, you know, you can take over a country by war or you can take it over by integration. And that's what he felt was happening. He felt that his identity was being uh, threatened. <laughs>
And that backlash has been very widespread in Europe, a backlash based on a fear of loss of identity. And that takes many forms. Sometimes it's the fear in, in a place like Poland, which is very religious, that secularism is going to overtake Catholic tradition. Sometimes it takes the form of overt racism, white people against non-white people, Christian against Islam, Western views against non-Western views. And this is a thing that Europe is going to be grappling with. Now, even the United States, which doesn't have that problem in that way, has the highest level of immigration that it has had since the 1920s. And so in the United States, you see a powerful backlash against this. So you have this fear of globalization of new, new products, a fear of Im immigration, which is to say new people, of new ideas, of so much that is unfamiliar, all in the background of, a, of a, an economy which isn't growing anymore. And so that is what has created the, the substructure that people feel is, has, has brought these enormous changes. So let me just say a few things about what I think maybe can be done, and then I want to give everyone a, a, at least a few minutes to ask questions if, if there are any. So obviously the first thing is people have to stand up for these core values, for the right of free speech, for the right to dissent, for the rights of minorities. People have to stand up for the idea that to criticize is not to be illegitimate. They have to demand the acceptance of their right to be heard. But that also means that liberals have to accept the legitimacy of others. When you say it's 1933 and we're on the edge of fascism, you are saying to all the people who voted for Donald Trump or all the people who voted for Marine Le Pen in France, you're a fascist, you're a Nazi, you're a brown shirt. Well, that ends discussion. And it's one of the reasons why I'm deeply reluctant to say that. Because I think that, that it's not going to work to meet intolerance with intolerance. It's not that it might not be justified. It's that I, I think it's not a successful strategy. And so I do think that, that liberal empathy has to be part of the liberal answer, not because it's soft and nice, but because it's going to be the only way to get anywhere. So liberals need to hear the grievances of people who feel left out in this globalized world. There's a wonderful book that I suggest any of you read if this interests you. It's a book called Strangers in Their Own Land by a, an anthropologist named Arlie Hochschild. And she spent time with Trump voters, with deplorables in Louisiana. And she said, tell me how you see the world. And in part, she was also saying, tell me how you see people like me, these liberal elites. And it's very, very eye-opening, not because everything sounds noble, but because the good stuff and the bad stuff are mixed up in, some, in, a, in, a, in a hole, and you can't separate them. And so you have, to, you have to hear this. And so when I think about the kinds of solutions that I believe in, they're not just things like we have to attack inequality, which clearly we, we do. But when we think about some of these issues that have proven to be so um, toxic, like immigration, we have to find ways of talking about it that are not completely unacceptable to, that are not completely hostile to people who don't think the way we do. The same is true with uh, issues like minority rights. And of course, when we think, how can we get the economy going again? It has to also include uh, the, the opportunities for people who now feel profoundly left behind. And so I really do have this fear that democracy and liberalism are going in opposite directions. Uh, but I think if we can find a way to once again make these liberal principles majoritarian, then we have a chance to save liberalism. 